During the pause, Haig transfers more heavy guns to Flanders, while the Germans assume that the battle is over and send troops elsewhere along the Western Front. On the 8th of September, in the east, you have the Kornilov affair. General Kornilov decides that he's had enough of the provisional government and orders the Russian army to go and take control of Russia. The provisional government panics and they decide to hand weapons over to the Bolsheviks and their Red Guard. As it happens, Kornilov manages to get nowhere near St. Petersburg as he's halted by a general strike of the railways, which means that the Russian army are halted in their march on their own government. But now in the east, crucially, there is this gap between the Russian army and the Russian government, and the Russian government has just armed the Bolsheviks. Back to the Western Front, however, Pluma plans in Ypres for a series of little battles, fought rapidly, one after another, a series of small little blows to break the German army on the field of battle. And so, on the 20th of September, you have the Battle of Menin Ridge Road. Now, Pluma had, had built trenches, like the German ones, behind the British lines to allow the British units to train attacking these lines over and over again. And so behind the British front lines, you have, a ser you have, you have the German lines that have been built out, out to allow the British to walk through the German lines in a practice behind the lines so that they'll know what to do when they go over the top. Pluma really is an, an exceptional general. The Germans are taken completely by surprise by the renewal of the Battle out of Third Ypres. At 5.40 a.m., special grenadier and light machine gun units attack the German lines. They know the Germans will counterattack. So, after the British have advanced only a thousand yards, the British halt and dig in, waiting for the German counterattack. And sure enough, the elite German counterattack divisions are hurled against the British lines, only to be slaughtered by prepared British defences. But losses are high on both sides. But the German elite units are shattered. Now, Goff had promised much and delivered less. Pluma had promised little and had given it. Bite and hold had begun. And the British had started to inch their way up the ridge. On the 20th of 6th of September, you had the, the battle for Polygon Wood. Again, both sides suffered heavy losses, but the British are now destroying German units faster than the Germans can produce fresh units. German counterattacks continue to be fierce, but German counterattacks now achieve nothing. Not a single piece of ground is retaken. But the losses rise and rise as the British and the Germans grind each other down in the Flanders mud. On the 4th of October, you had the battle for Broadsind. The Germans decide to change their tactics to deal with this steady British advance up the line, and they decide to launch an attack on the British lines to try and push them back down the ridge and hold their front line strongly. Normally, the Germans held their front line weakly and, and packed their second line. This time, they decide to pack their front lines and prepare for an attack to push the British army back. In a terrible piece of bad luck for the German army. The British artillery started their bombardment of the German front lines just as the Germans had prepared to launch their attack. And so the Germans start to go over the top and are instantly hit by this heavy British barrage. It's, it's just a spectacular piece of bad luck, but for the Germans, it's a slaughter. The single worst day of the war for the German army so far. Some, some German forces fall back before the German command even realise that the British are attacking. The German command can't work it out. There are reports that they are, their units are streaming back, but they know they've ordered them to attack. They, the German command adapt slowly. But despite the success of this day, a British breakout along Ypres is now impossible. But the, although the French are slowly recovering, they're still not able yet to fully hold their line with confidence. Capturing Passchendaele Ridge also would allow the British to have the high ground over Ypres in case they intended to attack out of Ypres now in 1918. But again, as the British are starting to achieve great success, 
the weather breaks. In October, there are only seven days without rain, and those seven days are overcast. On the 4th of October, Haig asks the French army if it's yet in position to be able to stand. He goes to the French army and goes, can I stop the Battle of Third Ypres? The French say, no, we're still not in a position to hold the line. Now, as it happens, that's probably a lie. The French army probably could now hold the line. But the French army are rather enjoying the sight of the British and German armies grinding each other down. Why should they give the British the opportunity to stop their attack when they know that the British are now paying the butcher's bill to grind the German army down? And so Haig, told that, he has, that the French army still can't fight, has no choice but to continue the battle of what will be known as Passchendaele. On the 9th to the 12th of October, you have the battle for Pale Capel. The British attacks provoke a crisis for the German army. They now order that any land lost to the British can't be retaken. They're now out of men. Germany has lost 159,000 men in the Battle of Third Ypres so far. The German army actually consider abandoning Flanders and the Channel ports, but ultimately reject the idea. The German army is now facing near certain destruction, and after the Somme, Arras and Third Ypres, is now desperate to avoid a fourth attritional battle against the BEF. And yet the rains keep on falling. On the 12th of October you have the first battle of Passchendaele. The attack fails in one of the costliest days in New Zealand history. But for Germany too it's a disaster and 1,000 Germans are captured. The French army on the 13th of October finally report to the British that they've recovered. Better still, and almost miraculously quickly, they report that they'll, they'll soon restart their offensive at Chemin de Dame. But they have something to ask now. They ask General Haig to continue, to, uh, continue the Battle of Third Ypres, to keep the German army pinned down at Ypres, as they believe that they can still break through at Chemin de Dame and win a great victory on the Western Front. The French are convinced they can still end the war in 1917. And so the battle for Passchendaele will have to continue once again to help the French, not now to help the French to recover, but to give the French their chance of winning the war. On the 17th of October, the French artillery open up along the Chemin de Dame. On, from the 23rd to the 27th of October, you have the Battle of La Maison. The German army is shocked by a renewed French attack. Gas is used in incredible amounts. It's incredibly thick. And as there's no wind, it lets the, uh, the, just the clouds of poison gas just lie over German trenches in these thick clouds. The French infantry storm forward and they take the Chemin de Ridge, the Chemin de Dame Ridge, in a great victory. The French advance six miles in four days, capturing 200 guns and inflicting between 30 and 50,000 casualties on the Germans for only 14,000 casualties themselves. It's a great success, a stunning success. But after only a few days, the French army report to the British that their attack is over. Meanwhile, the Canadians had been given the task of capturing the village of Passchendaele and had been inching forwards, ready to clear the ridge.